Uh, today, uh, I'm so grateful that uh, as we continue in our current uh, sermon series entitled Heart Matters, uh, that I will be joined by our finance and operations chair, uh, none other than Andy H. Choi. Would you give him a warm and great welcome? Good morning, Andy. Good morning. How you doing? Good. <laughs> Thank you for uh, sharing in this message uh, with me. For those of you who were with us last week, uh, you will know that uh, the sermon series is about uh, having some conversations uh, around money, uh, around generosity, and, and the things that really matter. And what we're finding is that the things of money and our relationship to money and what we would ultimately find as the things that really matter in life and in the kingdom of God, they are not unrelated. Um, and so we want to lean into this, especially in the season of Thanksgiving and giving and acknowledging all of God's goodness and also trying to discover more of what it means to be a member of Embrace Church and how we would participate. Last week, I shared with you a message entitled uh, Story. And I, I gave you a little preview that today we would be talking about sewing. And then next week when we gather for Thanksgiving Sunday, uh, you're going to hear a message about growing and, and generosity. Uh, today uh, we're looking at a passage uh, from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, verse 6 through 15. So if you have your uh, Bibles or if your Bible apps, if you can open up and follow along, that would be really cool. There's some blue Bibles in front of you as well. 2 Corinthians um, chapter 9, verse 6 through 15. Uh, this is one of many letters that Paul wrote uh, to uh, one of many of the churches that he, he planted about uh, 2,000 years ago. Um, and a couple of things you should know about this church in Corinth is that uh, the church in Corinth was, was not, not struggling in the sense of resources or finances. Corinth was a thriving city. It was a center of trade and commerce. Uh, think in New York City or London or Seoul, Tokyo. I mean, uh, it was a thriving area. And the church there in Corinth was also in many ways a thriving church. That it was not without uh, some of its own difficulties. They had some struggles of division and some incorrect theological understandings in terms of spiritual gifts and who's better and who's like, you know, rank and file and so forth. But, but generally speaking, uh, Corinth was a well-to-do church. Now, by the time that Paul is writing to this church in Corinth, the second letter, or maybe it's more correctly to say uh, the latter letter, uh, because there was a, uh, an initial letter and then a latter letter. There could have been some other letters in between. But the latter letter, we see here uh, uh, Paul giving some uh, very specific instructions to, again, thriving, wealthy, well-to-do, well-resourced church on how to give. And what you need to know is that the chapter before, we, we will not be reading that here, uh, Paul lifts up another church in a place called Macedonia. And this church was poor. Man, this church did not have near, not even close to the resources that Corinth had. And he lifts up Macedonia as a great example. And he says this, in their poverty, they gave. Now what an example, because a lot of times when we think about giving, we fall into that uh, when-then trap, right? When I have a little more income, then I will give. But the Bible turns that kind of thinking upside down and says, you don't wait until somehow you're in a better position to give. If you understand how much God has given to you, then you start giving now. And he says the Macedonian church knew how to do that. And even though they didn't have enough for themselves, they gave out to other churches in the name, which is so beautiful. So 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 6 through 15. Let's read this and then um, Andy's going to pray for us. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also uh, reap generously. 
Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, and God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. It's the 10,000 reasons. It's our worship, you know, acknowledging what God has given to us, and it's overflowing in thanks, is what Paul is saying. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. And I love this last sentence in our passage. Thanks be to God for his indescribable Right. <clears throat> Lord, Heavenly Father, just all praise and glory to you, Lord. We come to you in just multiple walks of life, Father God, with different crosses that we carry, but we come to you together and worship, Lord. I pray that through this service, through this message, and through this discussion together, Lord, I pray that you open up our hearts and that you humble us, oh Father God. For what do we have that you have not given us? Who are we that you have not made us to be? And what do we understand that you have not taught us, Lord? Us? I pray that you open up each and one of our hearts, Lord, and as he said, and I just sit here and discuss your word, Lord. I pray that this is a conversation that we have as a community, and that we join together to support each other, to grow together, and ultimately show closer to you, Lord. All this in your name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. So let me uh, kind of do a really quick recap of a message one last week when we talked about storing, right? Uh, if you were here last week, you will remember um, that according to Jesus, um, that our heart follows our treasure. Um, so in other words, if, if you put your treasure into material things, your heart will become materialistic. But if you put your heart into the things of the kingdom of God, like missions, for instance, or giving to the poor, or helping those that struggle with homelessness, especially as these months get colder and colder, then your heart will follow that treasure. And all of a sudden, you would begin to have heart for the people. This is so important that we understand this, that our heart follows your treasure. So we talked about, you know, where are you storing your treasures? We, we also mentioned last week that, uh, you know, in the Bible, there are 2,500 verses related to uh, how you're supposed to manage your money. And even Jesus himself, 15% of all of his teachings were about our relationship to money. Uh, he preached more on money uh, than on faith, prayer, heaven and hell all combined together. So you would want to think, man, maybe if Jesus is talking so much about money, maybe I should pay attention to what Jesus says, right? And despite all that's in the Bible, uh, it seems like my observation that I shared with you last week is that for most of us, you know, we go to God and we ask God for financial blessing, but not necessarily for financial wisdom. In other words, we would rather want more than be right in how we use our money. 
And we would rather be the mega million uh, dollar winner of that however 1.6 or 7 billion dollars that have a heart that is absolutely right with God. For most of us, we want that. And we highlighted that last week. And then last but not least, uh, we also heard that, um, you know, when you um, practice this idea of giving, what you realize is what you give away, you get to keep forever. But what you keep, this is Jesus saying, what you keep, you lose forever. It's all. And this is why, as we segue into today's message about sowing, why this biblical law of generosity is so, so important. And this is what we read earlier from 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Uh, or simply put, you, you reap what you sow. Uh, this is also spoken in Paul's letter to the Galatians. If you are a stingy person and you reap it or you sow in stingy ways, what you reap will be stingy as well. In contrast, however, if you understand the generosity of God in your life, if you understand uh, the heart of giving that is exemplified and embodied in the Jesus who came to this earth, died on the cross, and rose on the third day, and we live with that generosity, and we sow generously, then ultimately the Bible says this is a biblical law. This is a biblical law. If you sow generously, you will reap generously as well. I think a lot of times we don't take God at, at God's word, and, and we don't take this biblical law seriously enough, and we don't even, as we talked about last week, even try to test God on this. We, we find ourselves not uh, often uh, in those uh, positions and places of faith where we say, God, I, I'm going to, for the first time in my life, maybe I'll just hear what you have to say, and then I'm just going to commit to this and see what happens. Very few of us have actually been there and done that. And if this is true, what you sow is what you reap, then I think it begs the question, where are you sowing your heart into? What are the things that you're sowing your heart into? Uh, I'm glad that uh, Andy's here with us today because, again, Andy is serving uh, our church and our leadership team as uh, the chair of finance and operations, and he's been challenging our leadership team to be uh, more intentional about how we're planning, uh, how we're spending, uh, how we're being held accountable to what God is calling us to do in our lives. And, and we've been talking a lot about uh, our just vision of inclusion and impact, and I know that you've been bringing a particular voice in terms of impact. Um, we're trying to model our whole ministry around this idea of giving and, and sowing. And I wonder if you could share with us just some of the ways that, that maybe um, our, our ministry is sowing seeds for other people and also into the future. Thank you. And I guess I'm, I'm here, full disclosure, we're all volunteers as leaders, and I'm representing just the leadership team in a whole and what we're doing together as far as the mission of our church and how we serve and the ways we want to serve and grow as a community. And this, again, is the start of a conversation that we've been having uh, in regards to what it is to need to have impact and be part of this community. So if I can share a couple of things that we're doing here at Embrace. Um, you can see over here clear examples of Next Generation Ministry, the, the children's ministry has grown over 200% in the last year, if not more than that, yeah, maybe 300 percent. It's been an incredible growth, um, and that comes with resources. You know, things that we're doing on our part as a community to to kind of nurture and grow that. And the Kim family invested heavily into it in regards to their time and resources as well. 
um, the Covenant House is a, is a big part of our community. What we invest into um, homelessness, youth homelessness particularly, is an issue that we as a leadership team and as a community have chosen to really tackle on a local level and partner with the Covenant House intentionally to not just give financially, which we did over 20, 30,000 in the last year and a half, but also to invest our time to build relationships and share good news, right? And another aspect is um, Christina Thies. I don't know if you guys remember her last year, was an intern here um, serving under uh, P. Sam, who recently made a decision to pursue ministry. Um, and it's not just about financial things, and it's not just about nonprofit organizations, but it's about each soul and what we're doing on an individual level as well as on a bigger community level. And I think her dedicating her life at such a young age, I think it's something we're very proud to be a part of that, you know, however small or however big that was. Um, when it comes to the the recent um, Hallelujah Night, right? Yeah. The Hallelujah Night is um, we raise funds to donate a, a goat and two chickens. and two chickens to a community in need that's going to serve however many meals to families, and it's small things like that. Then we're not just doing that as an example. Oh, we have these resources, so we're giving it away. But we're also teaching our kids, the next generation, what it means to give and what that generosity feels like. And last but not least, but we're part of a bigger organization through the UMC, and we are receivers of grants that we also tie into. And not only do they support community efforts like Embrace, but also an education program at university in Africa, um, all across the world, and a lot of the disaster reliefs that happen, we, as a group, as a community, as a church, donate into that fund with a generous part because we know the impact that we that we're making outside of the, outside of the walls of our church. And I think these are just small examples of things that we're doing as a community. And it's not just us as a leadership team making these decisions, but it's you as members of Embrace, as, as followers and ser servants of God, like, that you're doing these things together with us. And I think that's the conversation I really want to kind of empower each and every one of you to really kind of be a part of. Thank you, and yeah, I'm hoping that we can have, yeah, you can applaud for this up here. that we're not just saying this is what we've done, but we're wanting to do more of this. Um, last year, uh, we decided as a leadership team uh, to commit about 20% of all of our income to go outside of this church. Uh, I think that's a big deal because even on a personal level, when we think about the time, we're trying to put 10% of our own resources uh, aside for, for the work of God, to honor God and, and to worship God. As a, as, a, as a church community, we're saying we want to do more than 10%, we want to do 20%. And actually, we have a vision as we move into the future, and, and we hope that you can get excited about it. At some point, we're hoping that 50% of everything that comes into Embrace, that we're just sending out into the world in terms of missions or outreach, in terms of helping the poor and making a difference outside of the community. Uh, this is what we want to do because this reflects the generosity of God in our lives and in this church. Um, and I'm so grateful that you're, you're continuing to push us to that. And a lot of that revolves around accountability for our leaders. Uh, I know that you've said this before, but you know, the finances of Embrace, it's, uh, there's nothing hidden, there's nothing secret. Um, it's fully uh, as, as transparent as you would want to know. So if you're ever curious about where dollars and cents are being allocated, uh, we will be glad to you know, give you a copy of the uh, budget. But uh, in so doing, uh, we pray that you're, you're not just getting that for information's sake, but you're getting that as a way of being empowered uh, to be a part of this conversation. Uh, Andy, this is what it looks like for our church, but I, I also ask you specifically to be a part of this conversation uh, because I, I want to I wanna know, and I think it would be great for this community to know, what does this sewing uh, look like for you in, in your life? Uh, how, 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 does, how does that live out? I've given a couple of testimonies here, and I think the really 
for my personal faith, um, what giving and sowing means is just worship. And I don't want to use that word lightly, but it's not so much about the money for me. It's about how am I going to draw closer to God? And what can I do to make that happen? Because I have a very firm belief in philosophy in life that if you're not growing, you're dying. Anything and everything in my life is about growth and progress. And money just happens to be one of those easier things to, to measure out and carry out. And when I think about the race and my involvement here, all of our leaders, we don't get compensated. We're not paid. We volunteer our time. And I give as part of my worship, like the offering, whatever you want to call it, tithe or thanks offering. But that's actually not the most important part for me. I actually value my time way more than I value the money that I give to the church. And because of that, what sewing means to me then is like I need to volunteer my time here and on the leadership team to make sure that the offering that I am giving is making the impact that I believe God called me to have. God gives me resources and opportunities, whether it's in my career or financially, to make an impact. But that impact is more important than me just giving a few dollars, but to be involved within the community and also to make sure that I'm challenging you as much as you challenge me to grow together, right? And I think sowing then becomes, uh, where, where is my heart? Yeah. Is it just about the money that I can throw a few dollars this way? Or is it, you know, it's beyond that, how do I draw closer to God? It's like I have to offer high my time in addition to that to make sure that I'm growing on a holistic level. So I think giving, to me, is, is, is that worship. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I, I, love, I love that, um, you know, one of the things that you're clarifying is that our, our giving is not just about a specific amount. It's, it's not just dollars and cents, and it's not just percentage. Uh, we, we get some standards uh, from the Old Testament about this understanding of tithe, we talked about that last week, about the first and the best that we're giving to God, and I hope that we're, we're going to embrace that more and more. But when we minimize it just to math, then I think we're, we're missing the point, right? Uh, God doesn't want just uh, a portion of our finances. God wants our lives, our, our souls. And uh, we, we mentioned this last week, but I think it's worth uh, repeating that giving really when you think about it um, is it's not about money matters. Giving is about heart matters. Your heart matters. And of course, money and your heart are not unrelated because so much of our heart still follows our money and where we put our money, that's where our hearts reside. The idea of giving is something that God has blessed us with. It's not something to be like a heavy yoke of weight or burdens. It's something that God wants to bless you with so that you can actually be free to be in relationship with God. So if this is true, then what's also true is that how you give absolutely matters. Not just the fact that you do give. Uh, we had a conversation at a really bad Japanese restaurant here in Alameda a couple of weeks ago as we were getting ready for this message. And, and you shared about kind of your upbringing as well. And, um, you're, you're a PK just like, just like me and growing up, uh, we, I know that your family struggled and my family struggled financially. And in this conversation you shared about just some of the things that you remember and you learned and I, I wonder if you could share some of that and also you use this expression, the art of giving. Uh, what, what does that mean for you? So full disclosure, I am a PK. <laughs> So I grew up, um, well, our family actually owned the business and was doing really well. Um, but through a lot of life circumstances and um, a calling, our family actually gave up everything to pursue ministry for my father and my, and my mom. Um, so it was, it was really different for me. And I, I think from a lot of you, the big difference was that I grew up kind of being exposed and seeing the financial side of, uh, of a church and like as I got older to understanding it and then finding my own faith and finding my own path. Um, with all of that said, when it comes to what we were talking about, the art of giving, like what is giving? And we were really just kind of discussing different things like is it generosity, is it service, is it all these different things? And the art of giving, again to me personally, was really understanding what it means to serve. 
Like, what is, what is this idea of this word giving, right? And it's only if you have so much that you're allowed to give. And I think money is, uh, whenever I have a conversation about money, I think mean, the one thing I really bring up is like, the way I understand money is that it gives me more options. It gives me an option to buy a nicer car, it gives me an option to buy a nicer brand, or it gives me options to provide food for maybe my family and some other people. It gives me more options, and then when I ask why do I want more money, or why do I pray for more money, what options am I asking for? Is it the option to better my own life and my, my direct family's life, or is it the option to have a big impact, to have a bigger influence, to, to give more, to serve more? And when I ask those questions, and when I pray about money and the art of giving, then is I have to understand where my heart is. Like, what do I want? And these, this, these are questions I've been asking a lot about myself and as I pursue my career and like I've made some drastic changes in my career and made some sacrifices and I reevaluate everything. It's like, where is my heart? And my heart right now is at the point where I want to serve. I want the money that I have and that I, that I offer to this church to have an impact. So what does that mean then to give? Then I want to give my time as well. So the art of giving to me then is understanding the why of what we want and what options we want and how we value those things and what we're willing to sacrifice in order to pursue those things. Because I think ultimately at the end, when I think about giving you, it's not conditional. Like when we think about the people that we love the most, we want to give so much to them. We don't expect anything in return. And I think that's the art of giving. Yeah. Amen. And, and I think that's how God gave to us. Uh, the Bible says, um, you know, God is the giver of all good and perfect gifts. And, and the greatest gift that God's given to us is Jesus' is one and only begotten Son. God literally gave us His, His own. And, um, you know, I, I was listening to this other message this past week um, about, about tithing and about generosity, and, and in particular about Corinth and, and, and Macedonia. And this pastor was making the point that, um, you know, if, if you don't give and you don't tithe, it's not like God's going to love you less. And God loves you completely and perfectly and abundantly right now to the extent that He cannot love you more even if you gave more. And certainly He would not love you less if you didn't give as much. And that becomes the inspiration and the motivation. When I think about discipleship and, and following Jesus, it's not just about uh, following rules per se, but I feel like it's about becoming more like Christ, having his mindset of him laying down his life and offering his whole self on the cross and for us to, to model that in our own unique ways. I hear that that's like the art of giving. Um, it reminds me also of this quote from Winston Churchill. Uh, a lot of you may know this. That he says, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. When we begin to really give in generous, in, in authentic, in, in ways that reflect the heart of God, man, that's when you really begin to experience the blessing of the life of that has been given to you. And I want to turn the corner and just bring, try to bring this uh, message to a close. And um, Paul actually gives some instructions to this church in Corinth uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 uh, about giving. And this is specifically what he said. And, and there's so much to unpack here. And uh, I'm not going to take a lot of time to do this, but I want to challenge you to go back and read this verse over and over again and let the Holy Spirit uh, dissect it and speak it into your heart. Uh, each of you should give what you have received, uh, uh, decided in your heart to give. Uh, in other words, there's supposed to be some forethought, right? It's, it shouldn't be haphazard. It shouldn't be last minute. We talked about this last week. That a lot of times, what we give to God on Sunday is kind of our leftover party money for the weekend. And God's not honored by that. God's not like, oh man, I'm glad that there's another 20. We can make it through another week. God's going to say, hey, you know what? Um, just 
keep it if you haven't really thought about it, right? So he's saying think about it, uh, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And if you look in the Greek, that word cheerful is an amazing word. It actually means hilarity, like laughing. Like he loves the giver who gives him so much joy that you are laughing out loud and you're just having such a good time. Just give, that's the type of giver that God, God really is honored by. It says, God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, um, uh, having all that we need, uh, you will abound in every good work. You see the cycle that's shown here? Uh, God gives, God loves, God blesses. We are inspired to give as well, to reflect the heart of God. And we do it not because we're forced to, but we do it because it's such a joyful occasion. When we give, I don't know if you've ever had that moment where you've really given a gift that you're so proud of. And your heart is rejoicing. And, and you know that you bless someone in that process. You know, simply put, uh, there's four things that Paul is highlighting here. Um, in giving. It's, it's obedience. But we do it because it, it's a way of reflecting our relationship with God. But we do it in joy. Uh, man, if, if giving causes you so much pain and, and, and just a discouragement and uh, a dismal outlook, hold on to your money because God doesn't want that type of gift. Um, and ultimately, that it's about thanks and action, that we're acknowledging, like we look at our lives, like remember earlier, like 20 minutes ago I said, think about the one thing that you can bless God about, that one thing was worship, and I, I love, I always love you bringing this back, that giving is our worship, and our worship is about thanking God, and we need to do that more often, we need to look at our, especially when we see people losing homes and losing family members to tragedy, like what we have in this moment, and thank God for and somehow that would lead us to some sort of action. Which then brings me to the last question that I want to ask you, Andy. Uh, maybe as finance and operations chair, or just as another member of this church, is there like a challenge that maybe you would like to give to uh, our friends here that's listening to this message? Absolutely. And I say this as a community as representing our leadership team, and representing Grace, and I, just from my heart, if I can challenge each and every one of you just to worship at a higher level, whatever that means to you. And then honestly, this conversation is not just about dollars and cents. Whatever brings your worship higher, if that's giving, if that's dedicating more time, if that's doing whatever it might be, the one thing that your heart is not willing to give up to God yet, I challenge you to do just a little bit. Start somewhere and start today. It's never going to be the right time. It's never going to be the right circumstances. What you have today is enough. And I can guarantee you, from my personal testimony, you challenge God with this and you'll see the blessings in your life. But that challenge needs to be very intentional. You need to set it aside. It needs to be tracked. You need to hold yourself accountable. And more importantly, you need to start talking about it now. Whether it's with us, whether it's with your friends. If it's serious, then you need to start planning for it. Because if you believe in God, and God being abundant, and not having a scarcity mindset where God wants to bless you, you need to challenge that belief. Let God do the rest. But you need to start with something today. So whether that's one dollar, whether that's tithing, whether that's dedicating your time, whether that's serving, whatever it is, bring your worship higher, that's what I challenge you to do. It's a great challenge, Andy. Um, I always like to close with the bottom line, as, as you know. Um, it's kind of my pattern of, of preaching here. And um, for those of you who know Andy, he's, he's, he's genuinely, I, I believe, a, a faithful, a disciple of Jesus and a worshiper of God, but he's also a businessman. Um, and um, recently, uh, our leaders, we, we joke because uh, 
And he loves to bring in business language into the conversation of the church. He even talks about the business of the church. And at a recent uh, leadership retreat, uh, he kept on using business terms. And we, we had this joke that, oh, okay, every time he, he says another business term, we're going to take a shot. And we'll all be drunk in five minutes, right? No, we, we, weren't, we weren't doing that. But just as a joke. And one of the terms that you like to use all the time, and you've spoken... This to me, I think on day one of sitting down in a conversation about visioning for how this church would work, uh, this term ROI, a return on investment. Who here has heard Andy talk about ROI before? Okay, a, a good number of you did. So, case in point. Now, this is the bottom line. Uh, there is um, an incredible ROI when we live generous lives and give faithfully. Uh, the eternal rewards uh, we reap will be literally, spiritually, immeasurable. It will be immeasurable. We cannot outgive the one who loved us so much that he gave his one and only son. And we cannot outgive the one who said, here is my biblical law of generosity. You reap what you sow. Sow into the things of the kingdom. Sow into the lives of others. Sow into those that are in greater need than you. And test me that I will not bless you with so much that it would be immeasurable on this side as well as on the other side. Okay. Amen. And so let's, uh, let's take a moment and pray for our hearts that we would really lean into a higher level of worship today. Now we're so grateful for um, just this time together as a community and being able to have a frank conversation about money and generosity, the art of giving, and everything else that matters in our lives. We're thankful that you bless us with this church where we can grow uh, in so many different ways in knowledge and, and in heart and soul, in the way that we lift you up with our songs of praise, but also the way that we commit our, our resources of finances and time. God, you're blessing us with this so that we can be positioned to have greater impact uh, in your kingdom things in this world. And I'm grateful for the testimony of my brother Andy and for his amazing leadership in this church. And I pray that what we have heard together, God, that you would sow that into our hearts so that in due time it would reap a harvest of faithfulness and goodness. Thank you for all that you have given. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I'm going to have you serve, continue with me.